Hey, everyone. Before we get to today's episode of Perpetual Chess, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who has supported the show. Ways to support Perpetual Chess include telling a friend about the show, subscribing on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use, better yet, leaving a positive review on that platform. But most of all, I want to thank the people who've supported me with the new Patreon page. If you haven't heard, it's patreon.com slash perpetual chess. And the suggested donation there is $2 a month. So I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. The donations go to cover things like the production, the audio equipment, and the hosting for the show. So if you can't afford it, you definitely shouldn't donate. But if you can, it's really appreciated and it helps out a lot. And guess what? I think it's also going to make the show better. What we're going to do is people who donate to the show will get advance notice of the guests and they will have the chance to send in questions to the guests. So if you feel like there's some topic I don't cover enough, or if you have some favorite player that you're waiting for them to come on, well, there's a good chance we're going to get them at some point. So now you can sit back and wait. And then when someone's coming on who interests you, you can pounce like a cheetah and get your questions in. I think this is going to make it a better show overall, more community driven. I've always said I want this show to be by the people and for the people. Well, I think that this will help make that happen. So thanks again for all the support and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Perpetual Chess Podcast. So we have an extra special guest today, the Grandmaster, the chess legend, the ambassador for chess, Judith Polgar. Judith, thank you for joining the podcast. Hi, it's nice to be here. Uh, Judith, I have to admit, I'm such a big fan of yours that I feel a little bit like I must be being pranked. So can you assure me that it's really you? <laughs> yes, it is me, it's Judith Fogger. Great, that is amazing. And I know, Judith, that you have the Global Chess Festival coming up on October 14th. Um, what else has been going on in your life? Uh, well, actually, I'm pretty busy with uh, with my foundation, the Judith Polgar Chess Foundation. We are doing our main activity is an uh, educational chess. We are running a program uh, in Hungary. Actually, from starting from 2013, it's part of the educational system nationally. Uh, is the chess palace and also the chess playground already for uh, kindergarten preschoolers. It just came out. Uh, my three books uh, for parents, for uh, home use, but also we make a lot of courses for teachers and uh, we provide a lot of material for parents by now also and also for schools. So that's uh, something we do very actively. Also, I do pretty much uh, lectures uh, uh, about decision making, about my experiences, how to to be on the top for many uh, years and to be motivated when you're doing uh, something on a high level. Of course, I'm a mother of two, so I'm happy to, to be at home. Uh, after I stopped and retired from competitive chess, uh, I can also spend more time with my family. But I'm very passionate about the Global Chess Festival and my initiative of Chess Connects Us, which actually I'm running practically all year round. It's only the festival is a celebration of one day, which is uh, each year, second Saturday of each October. Nice. Yeah. And I know that you have a, a very big event in Budapest, your home uh, city, and lots of events around the world. But before we get to the festival, Judith, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the curriculum, because I read where you mentioned uh, instituting this curriculum in Hungary in your book. And I just wanted to, to find out a little more about it, because obviously, us chess fans are, wish that there were curriculums like this everywhere. So is it at every school um, in Hungary? Actually, the way it works is it's an optional subject, the educational chess, and uh, our program is running about uh, in 250 schools for the moment, which uh, involves about 10,000 kids. We also have courses for 30-hour course for teachers, uh, about 800 teachers were taking the course. So it is the program is, uh, is uh, the idea is not to raise chess champions. 
but to make the kids think in a, in a wider uh, range, make connections, understand uh, how to think logically. Also, education in chess, we are using the values of the pieces. We have a chess palace where the chess board is projected on that so they can use the coordinates uh, very well and uh, in a playful, creative way. So it's, it has a lot of different elements using the moves of the chess pieces, the rules of chess, and uh, usually the feedback what we have that kids are very happily going to school and, and uh, has pretty much of emotional atta- attachment to our own chess pieces. The pieces has their names also, oh. like when Queen and, uh, and Rookie Rook. So uh, <laughs> it is a program where we try to inspire kids and also the teachers to think in a way, in a creative, playful way to understand that life also has connection in everything, whatever you do. And here also by using the 64 squares, the pieces, the movements, the values, and different elements and tools, we want to inspire really uh, to make the kids think in a, in a healthier way, in a wider way, uh, think like a 21st century kid needs to think uh, and uh, see the, the things in connections also in relation one to another. And uh, so far, the, the, the tests also show that the kids are improving in uh, most of the uh, other subjects also in school, like not only in math, which can be kind of logical, but also in reading, writing, concentration, cooperation with other kids, and also being more open. And we are very proud of this program. Yeah, it sounds it sounds great, and I'm not surprised to hear that it's having that effect on kids because I know there've been other studies uh, to to that effect. Um, and obviously, you uh, you sort of have a great perspective on what what to teach kids to, uh, due to your background. So, um, how much of the stuff that you know the legendary Polgar training program that your father uh, helped design for you and your sisters? How much of the material that you guys use do you incorporate into the curriculum? Well, it's important to understand that this is not a chess program uh, developed to to have the kids uh, compete in chess. It is really an educational tool for the teachers because actually it's taught by the school teachers, not chess teachers. So it is really, uh, we think it's a great tool for teachers to use all kinds of elements as a rule of chess. Of course, some of the elements, it is uh, similar to the way I learned the basics from my father and my mother, because when I started to learn the moves, it was not like that, that on one afternoon I learned all the rules. It was more or less the same way as here, that we spent some time learning the pawn half moves, then the other pieces. So that's how it comes, that you really learn one by one each piece, how they move and what they can do over the chessboard to reach from A1 to H8, uh, to learn many things on the way. So it's, uh, it's really step by step. And, but it's very important to know that this program is for average kids to develop their thinking skills. And of course, in many schools, the feedback is that the, some of the kids or many of the kids, they, they want to get involved in chess in a much deeper level, so they go after school programs and they start to compete also in chess tournaments. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask because I would think that if you expose a lot of kids to chess, then naturally some of them are going to just want more and more and more. Um, so are you, are there more opportunities for the kids once they do take an interest to pursue chess? Usually the schools who are taking this program, they also try to get a chess trainer so for the kids who are inspired to take the game specifically, uh, so they have more chance to get uh, uh, more knowledge uh, in already focusing only on chess. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and then you also have your festival coming up, the um, Global Chess Festival. So wh- what do you have planned for that? Well, each year I have many ideas, uh, all kind of programs we have. Uh, this year we are going to have, uh, looking at it from chess point of view, we are going to have an international uh, uh, future champions. That's the name of the event. 
where I invite and try to inspire kids under 14 and over 1,800 rating points to come over and play a blitz tournament, three, three minutes and a bonus of, of two seconds. So it's something spectacular for the audience, I think, to see kids playing very fast and uh, uh, bliss chess, which is uh, quite amazing. And I hope it will inspire uh, talents also. And they are they want to win and they want to show their strengths and challenge themselves. Uh, we are going to have the usual annual uh, simultaneous exhibition. My sister Sophia will be here. Myself will be giving a simul as well. We have a lot of lectures. We give uh, the educational program. We give it uh, for the first time to the audience, not only pedagogues, but also anybody can come and get a taste, get an inspiration uh, about the educational program for kindergarten preschoolers, also for, uh, for the schoolers. We are going to have quite some uh, visuals, which, which will be nice. One of our pieces, Wendy Queen, will be live there because it's going to be like a, a walking costume. Then we're always having all kinds of chess-related activities. We're going to have a painter while I'm playing a chess simultaneous exhibition. He's going to paint a chess-related uh, painting. We're going to have foreign guest uh, Jason Kochak with the Queen's Journey production. And we're going to have local kids accompanying his, uh, his performance. We're going to have the Hungarian Immortal Olympic Champions. We're going to have a Q, uh, Q&A, a chat, uh, fair play, and gender equality. That will be the topic. Uh, we're going to have uh, other activities uh, where kids can try out their strengths or even people, families who never been in any chess event, they can also find their activities to get a taste uh, in a way that they learn their first move. We're also going to have kids tournament, other kind for amateur kids. Also, we are going to have a generational clash where kids and parents, grandparents can be in one team playing over a board, alternating moves. And we have many other activities for, wow. uh, for, for people. We have a full day uh, stage events also. Sounds like uh, more chess than one can imagine and a lot of sort of fun twists on it. So I think, uh, I think people will like it. And I know that you have a lot of sort of satellite events. And for those listening, I'm guessing we're a little late for this year, but maybe next year we can, some of our listeners can help make it even bigger. Well, actually, the way it works, that uh, first of all, the Chess Connects Us initiative, if you go to our website, the chessconnectus.com, there is the chess map, so anybody can sign up who thinks that they really want to share their passion for chess and they want to show it with an extra number on the world chess map. We have already from 115 countries people signing up, and uh, this can happen all year round. People can sign up. But uh, we also have a menu with events. We have our own event, but I have already a lot of friends and people coming over to tell me that they also specifically organize their own event on this day. So they also want to strengthen uh, my initiative and our passion for chess, that we celebrate the game in different ways in many different countries, big cities or small villages. It doesn't really matter. The, the thing is that we want to show that on one specific day, we are really a lot of people and hope millions of people are sharing the passion. And, uh, and we also want to express it on a website, the location where we give information. And of course, there are other events where they, they do it anyway. And we try to gather all this information on our site. So whenever you travel uh, on this specific day anywhere in the world, I hope you will if you visit the website, you will find the location where to visit if you want to uh, get involved uh, on a chess event on that day. Great. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, and I'm sure um, people will check it out, and it'll just continue to get bigger over time. So, Judith... Uh, just want to, I would like to add that we are planning to have a live uh, Facebook coverage. So time to time, we are going to... to broadcast a bit of uh, taste so people who are doesn't have the chance to come over to Budapest and see our festival they are going to have a, a opportunity to follow it over the Facebook excellent okay so Judith I wanted to pivot a little bit and talk about what's going on currently in chess I know that the 
obviously all our listeners know that you retired from active chess uh, three years ago. Do you get a chance to follow events like the World Cup that's going on right now? Uh, I'm pretty busy with my other activities, but of course, time to time, uh, uh, I follow. Unfortunately, I don't have the time for all the game, but uh, I was following quite a few games. I was very happy that Rapport uh, was doing pretty well. He was in the quarterfinals. So that I was very happy with, but it's a, it's a great tournament. It's a very interesting challenge uh, uh, what's going on. And, uh, and of course, I mean, if you think about it, really the greatest, some of the greatest players are there playing the, uh, the final matches. So many people are criticizing the system, but I think eventually the bottom line is that still the very top players are getting there and stays in the, as the, playing the final. Yeah, initially it seemed like there were a lot of upsets, but the final four, which is what it's down to as we record this. Um, yeah, is generally that- speaking, uh, it happens, uh, disappointments happen in round-robin tournaments as well. That's a good point, and I yeah. think the knockout system can be more interesting for the audience. Of course, it's more blood, but on the other hand, uh, when I was uh, playing in the knockout tournaments, I think it has disadvantages, but advantages as well. If you're not in the right form, you don't have to play 10 games right. <laughs> in the tournament or 14, and you're very happy to get be, get to be eliminated uh, sometimes. Yes. I would, I would love to be eliminated by anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, looking more broadly at the, the – um, the global chess scene, the competitive landscape. I, you know, I tried to keep this a bit of a secret that I was uh, getting a chance to interview you, but I did reach out to a few people. And one of them was my friend, uh, Jen Shahadi, who had a question for you, which was, uh, who in the current um, chess landscape, um, who, is there any player that you would say resembles your chess style, who plays similar to the way that you played? Hmm. Uh, Rapport is kind of (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) <laughs> must be, must be from the Olympiad on a, coaching. <laughs> on a, sorry? Must be from your coaching him at the Olympiad. No, he was always like that, that playing very unexpected, unusual, uh, surprising moves. Sometimes uh, not, not very much understandable, but sometimes incredibly creative and fantastic moves. Uh, well, actually, I, I don't look at it uh, that way. I, I To be honest, I like many of the players. I mean... Really, the top players are playing fantastic, like Vashig Legrave, uh, Aronian. Actually, I'm, I'm happy to see Aronian is playing so well now, uh, again. Uh, for me, it's very interesting to see not only what they're performing on the chessboard, the players, but also to see the psychological uh, shape they are in because at this stage when you're... There are really very little differences between player and player on the top. So it's for me. It's very interesting to see the how they can focus and uh, uh, and really get the best shape and uh, have a good timing for the tournament. Right. Yeah. I saw, I read in in one of your books that you mentioned Leveronian as perhaps the most serious competitor to Magnus's title. This, your books are amazing, by the way. Um, Thank you. Uh, well. I- Aronian is a fantastic player, but in the last years, uh, quite a few times, I had the feeling that uh, he has to work on uh, on psychological uh, parts of the game to be able to perform in, in the most critical moments, because, of course, he's, he's a very good player and incredible preparation behind him. But, uh, of course, when... Uh, when you have the moment, that's the, the, the right moment to perform. And if it so, doesn't work out... So, excuse me, it's just I've, I feel like a lot of people would want to know, how do you, how do you work on that? Uh, uh, if you- well, first of all, you have to be self-critical, but also you have to have... Uh, sometimes you have to work with psychologists, I think. It's simply, I think the game changed a lot compared to 10 years ago, not to talk about 20 years ago. I mean, things are much more stressed than it was before. I remember when I was a kid, uh, chess was a, a game of uh, when you had training sessions, you always had someone across on the other side on the, of the chess board. You had your papers, you write your notes, etc. By now, it's, it's not about uh, being so creative in this way and 
take conclusions. It goes in a very slow way. But but nowadays, first of all, you have to be a very strong character to guide your engine programs. You have to be the boss to feel uh, how to, to, to guide the different chess programs, possibly, or even your or training partners. And uh, also, you have to be very, very wise how to make your brain work at the board, because you work a lot with computers, so it's it's very natural that you can always, anytime, 24-7, you can ask the computer, your partner, right. <laughs> so-called friend. Exactly. You can, <laughs> you can always ask uh, an engine, and actually there is a very big temptation to do so whenever you have a question in your head in any position. And uh, this makes also our brain pretty lazy sometimes, and I know some of the players has very serious problems that uh, even though they might have a very good preparation, when they go to the board, first of all, they get very tired already with memorizing and repeating all the lines. And, uh, and also very hard to switch your brain that suddenly you don't have your friend next to you asking questions or giving hints or giving uh, evaluation or whatever. So uh, psychologically, you have to be, I think, much stronger than before. And uh, I think seconds are also very important nowadays, human seconds, right. not the engine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so to be able psychologically uh, stay strong and also one of the biggest challenge, not only for chess players, but are, I think for busy humans, uh, because the, the life is very fast now, how to take your time out when you can really rest and recharge your batteries. So, and of course, uh, such a tournament like now, the knockout tournament, uh, all the players are extremely tired. But of course, each time you win a match, it gives you extra energy also, because uh, you don't feel tiredness because you know you have to go on. But uh, you do have to train yourself uh, psychologically, mentally, that how you take a loss, how you get over how how do you play your second game, for example, if you've been the first? Not to be too excited, but concentrate and focus and stay on the ground uh, to handle calmly uh, the situation. So this is something uh, I think uh, most of the chess players also realize that they have to to make serious steps and works into action as well. Yeah, it seems um, in a lot of the games, especially in the more recent rounds, I mean, it seems like the players are, they're just sort of feeling each other out. Like, I think it might have been Grandmaster Jonathan Tisdall said that basically they, they're trying out some line, but if the person doesn't go wrong, they're just agreeing to a draw and going to the rapid uh, playoff. Yeah, I think some of the players are having a very straightforward tactics, sometimes to make quick draws in classical games and then go for the, for the playoffs. Which also has to do, first of all, some of the players have more confidence in, uh, in rapid games or shorter time control. It also has to do that possibly the nerve system of some of the players, maybe they, they can't stand it so long and they prefer to have the tension for a shorter time. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, also you, you need lots of energy for, for such an event, for a knockout, and it, it is a big difference whether you can win your match out of two games or you're going to play a playoff or you have the free day when your uh, possible opponent is playing a playoff. So these uh, things are, are very tricky. And I must say that uh, one of the most uh, fantastic examples how to save energy and how to trick your opponent in a psychological way, uh, I was witness at the world championship match where I was the, the expert commentator in New York between Carlson and Karyakin when, uh, you remember, after game 11, they had a free day. Right. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Carlson was thinking that he's not going to put too much effort into his last game, but uh, he doesn't mind if it's an easy draw. Obviously, with this mindset, Magnus could easily rest practically on the free day, while Karyakin was, I'm sure, and I heard it, that was very stressful, especially his team also, to working on his last game playing with Black, that uh, how is he going to handle it? 
And by the time they finished the 12th game with a draw and Karyakin was spending his free day and last day of, uh, of the classical last game of the match, it took a lot of energy from Karyakin. And in the meantime, Carlsen was uh, practically mentally already preparing completely for the playoff. And we could see that practically Magnus just crushed Karyakin uh, in the playoff uh, because mentally he was there. He was much more... Uh, relaxed and, and uh, focused already for that. His mindset was much more ahead than Karyakin's for the playoff. So these things can, uh, can really change uh, and make a big difference, even though from outside it doesn't seem like uh, as a natural thing. Yeah, I mean, someone at my level, I, I would have trouble understanding. Like, I understand that you have to manage your energy, but I would think that Karyakin would still be able to use some of the preparation in the playoffs. So... Uh, why do you think it makes such a big difference? Because when you play, you have a 6-6 six, six in a classical match against the world champion. And uh, if he's called the uh, man of Carlson, you think you're a winner already. Right. And uh, because that was already a huge success for Karyakin to make 6-6, six, six, right? Yes. And after that, it's, uh, you have to play the playoff that you think you're on equal terms with your opponent. And I think Karyakin didn't have enough time to think that he has good chances in rapid game. And mentally already, Car uh, Carlson was uh, getting over on the very stressful, some of the most stressful days of his life, I think, on the, the last few games of the match. Uh, finally, he relieved and he thought, okay, now it's a new match and I'm going to crush Karyakin. So I knew, I saw completely new Magnus uh, when he was playing the playoff. He had energy, he was positive, he was very much focused. Why Karyakin couldn't recover, he didn't have enough time to get in, in the right mental shape to be able to oppose the right, uh, the right uh, way of uh, opposing uh, uh, against uh, Magnus. Okay. Um, so you, you talked a bit about the difference the computers make at the at the top level. I was also curious, like, again, your your family had this legendary training program. So if you were a young girl today and, and your father was going to try to put in place a similar sort of uh, learning style, how do you think it would be different with computers? Actually, it would be a lot different because my style doesn't really suit for playing against computers because my style is about how to combine tactics, psychological uh, elements, the practical way of playing competitive chess. If you see many of my games, of course, some of my games are I'm very proud because it's very sound. But also I've won many games the way that uh, I, I made such an unexpected move that I made sure that my opponent was using all his time and already in time trouble he got in, in, uh, in difficulties and then I won. And uh, those kind of things you can't do uh, against the computer, for example. And also the problem is with my style when I talk about computers that... Uh, if you work with a computer and I, I suggest these tactical moves many times, computer will encourage, uh, discourage me and point out my mistake in calculation and then probably I wouldn't be so optimistic making all these huh. <laughs> tactical ideas which can be very useful or successful against humans, but against computers it's not going to get through. Uh, as, as a good uh, option. So chess is really kind of, we can say, it's a completely different game now than when I started to play chess. But I also believe that, uh, that in the last five, six years, I can say that we have more interesting games than uh, before the computer times because I believe that many of the chess players by now they understand the engines, they use different kind of engines for different kind of uh, positions, for tactical, positional. They understand much better the computers and the computers also understand the humans better. So we are getting more closer to each other to understand and to rely uh, on the computer. Okay. Uh, I don't know what kind of player I would be now if... Huh. Uh, 
I would be a young girl and starting to play chess. And but in terms of your training methods, uh, I know that I mean you reached the 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 upper echelon so quickly. But do you think that you would be doing more like automated tactics online and stuff like that? Oh. I'm sure I would be using, uh, I, I would be training a lot on different sites. First of all, I was playing plenty, thousands and tens of thousands of Blitz games when I was little. So obviously I would be playing a lot of Blitz games on the internet uh, daily basis, I think. That's not a question. Uh, I would also solve a lot of puzzles and uh, I think solving problems. It doesn't matter which age we are living in, chess uh, uh, has this opportunity to to make your uh, level better by calculating and uh, using puzzles for strengthens your to strengthen your ability to work well at the board. This is very important. But uh, but of course I wouldn't work so much with the uh, humans. I think it will be like half half or something like that. But, uh, of course, uh, it is very important to, to look the old champions' games and to understand the game because this is also a big challenge of modern chess for amateurs, for example, but even for grandmasters to keep a balance between understanding the game and looking uh, really deeply into some of the ideas and uh, to run your engine and work on openings so much. I think even some of the top players... They don't have the best proportion on working on middle game, end game, and in openings. Yeah, it seems like once the players reach a certain level, like the top twenty or so, openings take a um, they take a bigger and bigger role. Well, that's uh, obvious for me in my chess career. Uh, practically, I can say that openings were probably my weakest. Uh, uh, part of the game. I was always the strongest uh, in middle game. And in many times uh, I was giving such a hard time for myself in opening that I had to shuffle things uh, with uh, 10 times uh, more energy in the middle game than uh, if I would need to, to use if I would get uh, out of the opening in a good way. Uh, but of course, uh, openings uh, is is much more important nowadays, I believe, than before, because simply everybody has the information in databases. So, so you really have to know what you're doing uh, in the opening. Though, if you think about it, you, you look at Magnus Carlsen or some of the players. They sometimes they just avoid the very sharp lines and they play chess. But, uh, of course, opening, it is very important. And the higher level you go, the more everybody pays attention on the opening. But we shouldn't forget that since we don't have a journ game, I don't know how many of the, our listeners know uh, the time from the journ game. But uh, uh, so practically the last 15, 20 years, definitely end games became much more important than it was before. And uh, there are lots of mistakes made by everyone, not only by the weaker players, but also grandmasters and the best players in the world. I mean, we can remember uh, Carlsen and end match, how many mistakes were made in the end games, because you're getting tired already. And also, there are a lot of knowledge which you have to know because you're tired on the, at the end of the game and also you don't have enough time. So I think, uh, for example, Magnus, uh, from this point of view, he, he invests uh, more time uh, in end games than, than, than other players. Yeah, which, and uh, it pays off. It definitely does. Um, okay, J- Judith, I know that you, you're a busy woman, so just a few more questions, if you don't mind. Um, okay. So uh, I know that you opened your TED Talk with, with the funny line, before I was born, my parents decided I was going to be a genius. Uh, and... Related to that, we have I, I do a feature where we have some people, uh, supporters of the podcast, send in questions. And we have a question from Peter Newhall, which is, uh, how much of potential chess strength is talent and how much is hard work? And what strength is possible without any special natural talent? Well, I believe that uh, uh, work is like at least 80%. Wow. Okay. Because... Uh, I think some of the people say 99. I don't know. I think it's it's really at least 80%. Uh, 
Because you can have talent, but without work, it's most likely it's, it's going to be lost. While if you're not so talented, just an average or a little talented, but you work very hard and uh, systematically, then you will reach higher. Uh, so it's, uh, to work is, is definitely, definitely the sure way of, uh, of reaching results. Okay, but I mean, just to push back a little bit, if, if every child does the same amount of work, there, do you think that their talent levels would end up uh, like different or pretty similar? Well, they can be talented, but the thing is that uh, it, uh, to be, for example, successful in chess, it very much depends on not necessarily only about the knowledge you know about the game and understanding, but your character traits, how much you're competitive, for example, what kind of uh, environment you're growing up, how motivated you are, how f- much fanatic you are, uh, how persistent you are. Uh, and and many many things uh, you need to be very successful because I know quite a few players who has great knowledge more than I do but didn't even reach the grandmaster level necessarily you know because they are researchers they understand the game they know a lot of openings they understand the details of it but chess is not only about openings or not only about middle games. It's a very complex game and you have to start move one and sometimes finish in uh, 95. So for this, and chess became very much of a, of a sport. It's a mental sport in principle, but I think you need a lot of uh, uh, physical strength also to be able to, to go from one tournament to another, also to play one game after another. And you need a lot of mental strength to be successful and get over on success, not to talk about defeats. Okay. Um, just a, a couple more questions. One more from our listener. This one is from Steven Zajic, um, who is also a chess teacher, and asks, what advice might you have for coaches to help them keep talented young girls and women playing competitive chess? Um, this is a difficult question. I always believe, and, and also in, in uh, my tournaments, which I organize uh, now, the Future Champions and also the, the Chess Palace Cup at the festival, I never put them separately. I always make them play in one tournament, girls and boys. I don't give separate uh, uh, prizes for the girls or boys. I think we have to, uh, we have to inspire girls to, to get better in the game. Of course, uh, I understand that many people tells me that uh, from social point of view, the girls like to be more with the girls, not with the boys. But I think still uh, we should we should inspire girls more that uh, chess is a game. Chess is something we use our brain. So it doesn't matter whether you're a girl or a boy, you have the same chances. Of course, if you want, you can go for the girls tournament because you want an easier way of uh, reaching results. But I think it's very important to to give them self esteem, give them support, to to tell them that everything is possible and they can really be good. Doesn't matter whether they are girl uh, or 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 boys. I think this is very important. I feel very fortunate that I grew up in a family where my parents were all the time telling me. So it was very natural for me to play with adults and and uh, and men. Okay, and you so have- I. I- I always inspire girls that if they like the game, enjoy the game and improve objectively, improve your level, not to think so much about the girls' competition, but improve your level. And I think for, for girls also, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great feeling to beat, uh, beat boys uh, around in the same age group. Yeah. Um, and you had such a notable sort of fierce attacking style. So besides from your, your parents uh, just giving you confidence generally and telling you uh, generally that women can do anything that, that men can do, was there something they did to sort of like uh, um, help you build that sort of aura of, um, of such strength that you're, you're so well known for in your games? Generally speaking, I think sometimes it's simpler than uh, than we think. 
But the most important thing was from my parents that they always believed in, in me and my sisters that we are able to do it and we are capable of, of reaching the same result. It doesn't matter whether we compete between women or men. The reason is why I was playing against men uh, after a while I played on the Olympiad uh, twice and won uh, under-16 world championship between girls. But the reason was to play against men not because specifically my father was saying that we cannot play against women. No, it was because we wanted to play against stronger opposition and improve our game. That was the main idea. And, uh, and uh, I grew up in an environment where chess and game was important and not that play with the women or men, but we are really focusing on uh, uh, the right tournament, the right chance so we can improve as fast as possible. And this is something very much unique to play against stronger players, to be able to strengthen yourself, to see your weak spot and to train that to improve and how to overcome uh, on that weaknesses. Yeah. Um yeah, and it's good to see that uh, Hu Yifan is now sort of following in your footsteps with the same approach. Well, to be honest, uh, I always say that, for example, with Hu Yifan, if, uh, if she would be ready the way that the uh, same amount of putting into chess training, if she would have her mindset and the people around her, she should become the world number one in, in chess, or getting the top 10 between uh, the best players, I'm pretty sure her rating would be about 20, 30 more. Just by the fact that her mindset would be on, uh, on, on, on this, uh, really focusing on the game and the penalties. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last sentence? Uh, if, she would, uh, if her dream would be to become the world champion in lady, but if her goal would be to become the best possible in chess, with the same training what she was doing on now, I think her rating would be Okay. Um, so we're, lo- we're losing you a little bit on the mic, Judith, but I just had one more question uh, anyway. Um, so naturally, I would be remiss. I, at the conclusion of your trilogy, I, I, again, just want to stress how much I enjoyed your books. They were incredible. Um, the games are amazing, as are the pros, and the pictures are great, too. Um, so, But at the conclusion, you do leave the door cracked for a, a possible return someday to competitive chess. So these books were published three years ago. Is there any update to that uh, thinking? Uh, For the moment, I'm very busy with my activities promoting chess, the festival and the educational programs, developing that, Uh, and my family. uh, You know, never say never, but uh, I follow chess, and maybe one day as a grandmother, I will be competitive (laughs) in this senior uh, event, but for now, I'm not thinking a real comeback. Okay. How interested were you in Gary's little comeback? Uh, I was uh, very anxious. I was uh, I was uh, interested, and I was following quite a few games. But uh, of course, whatever he can perform, it's fantastic. Because once you don't uh, compete, even if you you follow the game a lot, uh, you lose your your touch to the critical moments for sure. And you could see it and follow it uh, live that. Uh, how rusty Gary was, and I was not surprised on that, to be honest. Okay. Now, if he were to continue, do you think that he could get those kinks out? Well, first of all, uh, the the first question would be his motivation, what he wants to get out of it. I think in one hand, he was uh, extremely nervous and uh, interested also how it will work out. But he, he loves the game. That's pretty obvious. But just by loving the game, you can't just come back and uh, play games with the very top players in the world. Of course, psychologically, everybody has a great respect for Gary Kasparov. But on the board, not necessarily everybody shows respect. <laughs> right. 
Okay, well, Judah, I know that you're very busy with your family and the chess festival, so all all of us fans of yours will keep our fingers crossed for your return as a grandmother. But in the meantime, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and, and sharing a few of your stories and telling us about uh, some of the, the secrets of your many successes. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. Special thanks go out to our Patreon Perpetual partners. They are Chris Wainscott, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Gary Andrews, Jennifer Valens, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Matthew Tedesco, Ricky Grijalvo, Rob Lazorchek, and Tim Seymour. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll catch you guys next week.